leverage and our variation. So one of the things that I think is linking from the previous and this uh, presentation, I'm curious about um, fertility ideals or preferences, how they have shifted. Because you're looking at the data but they, on, on what's happening, but I understand from some of the surveys that in fact this policy has also brought big changes on, on the desired fertility dropping below two. And so, uh, do you have any evidence on that? And what do you think this is going to have a play a role and in fact is to tax some of those changes? It could be hard to answer because we mainly focus on the registered data. They only have this kind of. Yeah, but do you okay. have any other, do you know uh, of any other evidence that it may be explaining that? I know in this data you don't have it, but I'm just curious to see whether, you know, this policy change has actually brought some, whether the policy change has brought some stable changes in the idea that are going to be very hard to, to change. Yeah, I think for the desired family size, it could be referred to more other factors, you know, economic or education or something else, but it's not for sure. No. I, I have some secret slides here that I can show you. <laughs> so, in case you ask for some questions, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> more, yeah, yeah, yeah. We take some more points to look at, you know, the <coughs> single and the maybe education. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I did put here. So it means, you know, education, the cost to raise kids, and yesterday presentation already showed, I think with Sonia, to show the indirect or direct cost. I think with the same if in China, because the Chinese parents always try to push their children to be the top. It's been a falter to the education, or housing, and something else, you know. So I think this will be affect all the family size, you know. If you want the children to be the top one, you you cannot afford so many, maybe just the one like me. I, I only could have one. If that second, I will back up. So I think it's a really economic way and also the family support, you know, in China now it's so strong. We didn't have the child care for the children and three, you know. You have to rely on the family to to support you until the children could go to the kindergarten, you know, after three, you know. It means this three year could be suffering, you need to balance the work and the family. So it's not so easy. We didn't have this, this kind of family support family to help you to balance it and to send the children to kindergarten and you know, so for the child care. So now it's the government tried to put the policy in this way, but I think time will be more than ten years we we'll say how people could change the family size. Maybe they have a big family size, but if they cannot do it to be materialized, you know, cannot be true, they need to wait. Maybe they may sometimes, you know, because they're already in a late age, you know, they not so easy when you are ready now for the economic factors, you know. <coughs> oh, also, could you tell us uh, Actually, Alicia was asking, Alicia was asking about preferences, not factors driving fertility. So the question was, Think whether many women, for instance, now would like to have only one child because it's their ideal, it's their vision of what they want to achieve. They don't want to have two kids. Their ideal or their intention would be one child, maybe partly as a consequence of the respective policies in the past or as a consequence of living in a society with so many people having one child. Do you see this happening? Does the literature show anything like that? It means that people already changed Big family size, just not, yeah, I think it should already happen. But uh, if the family support could be strong, maybe they will shift a little bit to big family size. I'm not sure because it's, you know, prefer one child, maybe it's what happening on our cohort, maybe the new cohort. I don't know what will be changed in the future, whether they go to the way in Japan, you learn child based on the main single, or they will. Prefer to tell, uh, I think we don't know, it depends on society to how to respond to this kind of new hot different cohort. So there are no surveys on that, asking them what they want. Currently, I Maybe, no. maybe Professor Gu could be more during grief. Yeah, next yeah, yeah. question. You can go <laughs> with you to ask uh, me, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm John Ma from the, uh, the China Population and Development uh, Research 
Center, so we are colleagues. Uh, with uh, but I'm very uh, happy to see Chilling get a so excellent study. Um, I have a passion that uh, uh, it's very, I think it's very good study to see how their uh, policy uh, uh, affected their ability in China. So that is a very, very uh, critical, I think it's a critical point to study China's uh, ability. So uh, my question is that you, you, you used the uh, long, I mean, uh, so many years data to see, but uh, how, I mean, how to explain the, uh, the policy effects, I mean, from the yesterday to today and to future? Because, I mean, uh, the population, uh, I mean, the, the couples, you know, the, uh, in three years, in, in thirty years ago, are not is different are uh, different from the couples in today. Do in I three sense? years, in three years, thirty years, years ago. I mean, thirty years ago, because you use the data, uh, you want to uh, uh, you want to uh, check you want, you want to examine the, the policy effects on the uh, on different years, right? Okay. 90, I only did that them by four years in term or one year before, three years after. I didn't compare the, the cohort who have second birth 30 years ago with the cohort after second children after 40 years. No, we didn't do this kind of cohort different differential analysis. No. Okay. Uh, you, you know, in China nowadays, the, the policy, the pol just like the professor who says, uh, the policy effects became uh, weak and weak, weaker and weaker. The, the economy and the social effect became stronger. That's the, our next research we will include the economic and social development to make to use multi-level model to give, differentiate the policy effect and also the social economic development. We cannot do it in the same time with so much policy background and this kind of thing. I would like to have one reflection of these policy efforts. If you can show the slides with period VFRs, yeah. which were estimated from the data set. So we estimated it on the basis of the registered data for these 50 million people. So it's not fully representative of China. No, the trends in the VFRs. Yeah, yeah, this one. Very quickly, this one. So, saying that policies have no effect is perhaps uh, a little bit too radical because if you look what hap what's happening is the second order total fertility rate, it's increasing rapidly, especially around the period when the second birth restriction policy was abandoned. Imagine the second birth restriction policy would be as tight as here in the 1990s, and at the same time, first birth rate would be declining as we observe after the year 2010, imagine what would be the total fertility rate in China. But what we see is the postponement transition kicking in. Women postponing their first child, postponing their first marriage, maybe because they get higher education, they have other preferences. So the policy effect is here, the second birth rate is increasing, but then there is postponement transition coming in at the same time, and first birth rates are going down. Overall, not much change in total fertility rates. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Actually, do what the conference organizer is doing all the time. Yeah, sorry, sorry. A nasty guy. Okay, I think we can thank uh, Kuling and all the presenters of this great session on, uh, on uh, fertility in East Asia and uh, Southeast Asia. Thank you very much.